Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I am here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and so happy that you decided to join us this morning as we go behind the scenes at the aquarium and learn about what it takes to make an exhibit like the one you're looking at right now. Now, during this program, I encourage you to text in any questions that you might have uh, so we can answer them live in your program so you don't have to keep uh, wondering about things. And you can text the number that you're going to see on the screen. We have a phone number, and of course, children, make sure you have your parents' permission before you text. Um, but we'll bring that up right here. Um, during the program, if you have questions, you can text 562-286-1838. However, if you are watching this at a different time, that isn't 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday um, Pacific Standard Time, or Pacific Time, go ahead and you can email us any questions you have at live at lbaop.org. So if the program's already happened, but you still have questions that come up, uh, feel free to email us and one of our educators will get back to you um, when we are available. So... Um, what are some of the things that go into making an aquarium? Have you ever visited an aquarium before? Well, even if you haven't, we're going to go on a virtual journey today and you can check out the exhibit right behind me. This happens to be our largest exhibit here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. It is our tropical reef habitat. So if I step off to the side and you take a look at some of the animals that are in here, I want you to think for a minute about what would it take to create a habitat, to create an environment like this? What kinds of things need to happen? What kinds of information do you need to know? So I'd love to hear what some of your thoughts are. So if you have a moment, if you're able to text us that number 562-286-1838, what do you think would be some really important things to know about or be prepared with uh, to create a habitat like this? What kinds of things are you seeing in here? What do you notice? What type of environment are these animals living in? And how might this habitat be different than, oh, maybe an exhibit like where our sea otters are, uh, where the water, um, like up in our northern Pacific gallery. We also have another gallery here at the aquarium called our Southern California and Baja Gallery, where you'd find animals that we could find off our coast um, right here in Southern California. So how might that be different than an animal you might find in a tropical Pacific area? Uh, so if you have any comments or questions or thoughts, go ahead and text those in, 562-286-1838. And my friend Courtney will be happy to see what you're typing, let me know, and we'll be able to answer those or include those questions live during our program. So what kinds of things do you notice in this habitat? As I mentioned, this is a tropical habitat. So I was comparing it to our northern, like where our sea otters are. Think about the temperature of these two exhibits. Well, the temperature is going to be very different. Do you think this is going to be warm water or do you think this is going to be cold water? If you're thinking warm, you're right. <laughs> it's Tropical positions or tropical places have a lot of sunlight, a lot of heat from the sun. They're near the equator. And so our water temperature is going to be very different in this exhibit versus one where our sea otters live up near Alaska. Oh, we had an excellent question from whose class was it again? Rodolphin. Okay. Wondering if the plants that you see here are real or fake. That is an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. Because first of all, let's see. Like, what is it that you're talking about? Are you thinking about these things here? Because this, this kind of looks like a plant right here. And there's some frilly stuff kind of around here, maybe down at the bottom. Well, because I mentioned this is our tropical reef habitat, what we're looking at here is actually not a plant. Do you have any idea what else it might be? If it's not a plant, what you're seeing here is a type of living animal, but there's lots and lots of them, and they are actually what's responsible for creating this. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have any guesses? So it, they look like plants, but they're actual little tiny animals. In fact, what you're seeing here would represent hundreds and thousands and probably millions of animals, not just the fish. I'm not talking about the fish swimming around, but these things that look like plants. Any idea what those would be? And by the way, this is an example of an artificial one. So what you're seeing is plants. Those are not real. They're not living. Um, 
Yes, and some of you responded as coral. You're absolutely right. So this is a coral reef habitat, and corals are indeed animals rather than plants, even though they look like plants. But the corals that we have in this exhibit happen to be artificial. And let me tell you why. Corals can take a really long time to grow. I don't know if we have any pictures of any um, corals by themselves or what corals look like. Um, we'll see if we can find something for you to look at. But we're kind of far away. But you can see that corals create this big, huge reef. There's different kinds of these coral animals. Some are what we call soft corals. Some are artificial, or I'm sorry, some are hard. So we have hard corals and soft corals. The hard corals are the ones that build these reefs. So this one right here, this is an artificial example. This is a closer view of what we have in that large exhibit that we were just looking at. So really fake looking stuff. I mean, it looks real, but it's actually artificial. But don't tell the fish. They don't seem to know the difference. They treat it like it is the real thing. Um, you'll notice there's lots of different shapes, lots of different colors. But this, again, is all artificial because coral can take up to a year to grow even one inch. So this is more than one inch. Think about the hundreds of years that would be represented in looking at what we were just looking at in that big artificial reef. So we, if we were to try to collect that much coral out from the natural habitat, we would be wiping out and destroying the ecosystem. So when the aquarium first opened, they said, we do not want to do that. We want to create that type of habitat, but we don't want to do any harm to the natural environment. But we want to make these fish feel like they're at home. So we created, or we were able to purchase and create this artificial reef for our corals, or for our exhibit and for our animals. Now, what's been really exciting since the aquarium opened, we've had some time to actually have some real live corals that we've been able to grow. So when we first opened the aquarium, we had one little exhibit that we called our live coral exhibit that had living, breathing, growing coral. Um, and then over time, we were able to get those corals to grow bigger and more, and we were able to put them in other exhibits. So now I am happy to say most of our exhibits here at the aquarium that are in our tropical habitats, if they have coral in them, it's live coral. So that's really exciting. And let's see what it takes to grow coral behind the scenes. In fact, we might even have, I hope, um, do we have any pictures, Courtney, of any corals maybe that we have behind the scenes? So you can see we have to start off very small. We take, um, sometimes we get what are called um, frags or little fragments of the coral pieces of these coral animals that are living um, because sometimes people have, you know, illegally collected it. You can't go out to the reef and just break off a piece of coral and then bring it back home and think, I'm going to put this in my aquarium. Well, there have been people who've tried to do things like that, um, but you're not allowed to do that when they discover the customs or when you're coming back from your dive trip, you come back into the country, they say, wait, you have this illegal coral, you can't do that. Well, they confiscate it. They take it away so that those people don't have it anymore. Those people get fined a bunch of money. And then they're like, well, what do we do with this coral? We can't fly it back to the Great Barrier Reef and put it back there. Well, that's where the aquarium comes in. We are one of the places that has been allowed to accept that confiscated coral that we can grow and then use in our exhibits. And this is a really great picture, a close-up picture of some live coral. And you can see um, how different it looks closer up. In fact, does this remind you of any other type of animal uh, that maybe you've seen before? Just maybe a smaller version. What are the things that you notice about this coral? Well, one of the things I notice are the bright colors. So I see that there's some really um, like bright green colors. It looks almost like a purplish or peachish color even. It looks like they kind of change colors on the end. So there are a lot of different colors in corals. And these are coming from special algae inside called zooxanthellae. Um, little tiny algae inside getting light from the sun. And then they're creating food for the coral and they're creating the color for the coral. So living corals have beautiful, gorgeous colors um, as they're all together on the reef. But if you notice, oh, and here's what we have behind the scenes. So this is the area where we have behind our tropical reef exhibit, that one big exhibit we were looking at in the background when we first started the program. Well, look inside these tanks. This is pretty cool. This is live coral in here. And down here on the bottom, these are pieces of live coral that we're able to grow. Now, like I said, it takes a year for some corals to grow even an inch. So it can be a long process. But we have these different tanks. And what are the things that you notice about this space? 
Are there any things that stand out to you as you look at this? So this is behind the scenes. So your special view behind the scenes at the top of our tropical reef habitat. And this is our coral propagation area. So propagation means where you're growing it. And so this is what it looks like as we're growing corals. So we have, let's see, a few different tanks. We've got this one here. We've got these two back here. We had that other one that we saw when we first started. So that's four tanks right there um, where we're growing these. But look at all these pipes that we have here too and all these little red knobs. <laughs> well, that's allowing us to change the water flow. So we can adjust it so it's just the right amount of water that we need because we need to be filtering that water and changing it all the time and making sure that the corals are getting the foods that they need. So what kind of food does a coral eat? Well, different types of plankton. They're eating plankton in the water and some of that plankton can be like algae. Um, some of that plankton could be live animals, little teeny tiny animals, uh, but we grow a lot of our food here at the aquarium to feed to these animals and help them to grow. So we might even have a picture of what it looks like at our live food areas where we have these tall towers where we raise a type of animal, type of plankton that we call brine shrimp. So brine shrimp, little teeny tiny animals, Oh, here's a great picture of some corals. So these are what some corals look like, a live video of what we saw, those polyps before, those long polyps. They kind of look like sea anemones to me, but very, very small. And so those um, anemones now have kind of brought in their tentacles. So you don't see the tentacles waving around as much as we did in that last picture, but you can still see this um, individual, what we call a polyp. The polyp is the individual animal of the corals and the corals all just happen to live in the same place. It's like sharing a big apartment building. So all these individuals are living in their own little units um, on the coral reef. And together they have a structure that would create, it would be a hard coral with this skeleton that would basically we see the shape when the coral was to die. But the, the living coral is just kind of this outer covering around it. So this is kind of this coating over the top, which is why it looks kind of blurry, fuzzy. Um, that's part of the polyp. But if the coral was to die, that, that actual living animal was to die, then they would just leave behind this hard skeleton that you've probably seen before, um, whether in decorations in people's houses or homes or um, in stores on TV. Um, maybe if you've been to a beach and you've seen a piece of dead coral on the beach, it's, it's dry, it's hard. But if you look carefully, you can actually see these little tiny holes where every individual coral polyp used to live. But when we're feeding these animals, some of them, some of these animals have such tiny mouths that we are not able to feed them. Um, like we can't chop up food like fish small enough to put into their little mouths. So we actually have to raise um, food like this. This right here is a brine shrimp. So brine shrimp are really tiny. And in fact, they're so tiny that if you were to put a whole bunch of brine shrimp together in um, uh, like a pitcher and make it really, really concentrated, it might just look like orange Kool-Aid because you're like, I don't see anything. It looks like orange Kool-Aid because that's what it looks like when we feed our animals. When we feed, uh, say, our moon jellies, what we do is we feed them all these little teeny tiny brine shrimp and it looks like we're just pouring orange Kool-Aid into the water. But then if you were to look really closely at that orange Kool-Aid, you would see that it's not really orange Kool-Aid. The water itself isn't orange. It's just that there's so many of these little teeny tiny orange specks, which are animals that look like this, that it makes that whole thing turn orange in color. So this is kind of a close-up view of what that food is, that live food that we prepare behind the scenes. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll be able to find a video of what it looks like as we're growing those. Because we grow them in stages with these big cylinders next to each other. One might be a little bit um, different color because when we get them as eggs, they have hard capsules on the outside. And when they hatch out of those eggs, um, then we need to separate. And then we have to run that through a special thing to take out the hard egg cases so that just the, the little tiny um, animals are around. And then we can feed those out to our animals. And then as they get bigger, then we can feed those to somewhat bigger animals. But we also grow a lot of algae behind the scenes too in these little beakers. It almost looks like a mad scientist lab. And we're able to take those beakers of the algae, feed them to our brine shrimp so that they've got lots of nutrition inside their bodies before we feed them out to our other animals. But are there questions that you've been wondering about 
behind the scenes. Did you think of any other ideas of what might go into taking care of our animals? Obviously, we need to be able to feed them. So we need to have a place where we can prepare their food um, and make sure that they're ready to go. So we just looked, or we were talking about the little tiny animals. We also do get, do get bigger um, food for our animals, like squid and fish and um, clams and mussels and, and things like that, that we prepare in a different part of the aquarium. But then once we feed our animals and the animals eat, eventually the animals are going to have to go to the bathroom. So there is a lot of cleaning that needs to happen. And there's a lot of different ways that we can filter our water. So what are the ways? Of course, we could just like scoop out poop. <laughs> like if it was big enough, we could just grab it. That'd be great. No one really wants that job. But if you were to physically remove an item like a solid or waste from the water, that would be what we call a physical filtration or mechanical filtration. That means you are physically taking an object and like straining it, capturing the physical parts so that you could remove it from the water. And we have things behind the scenes at the aquarium that we call sand filters. And here's a great view of what it looks like behind our exhibits. These right here happen to be sand filters. So all of these pipes, you can actually watch the arrows. You can see the direction that the water is flowing. So water is flowing from somewhere down into this and it's creating the sand filter creates an area where the water can be physically filtered and the way we do that is by running the water with the the poop and all the junk in the water over the sand and then what happens is as the water goes over the sand the sand captures all that yucky stuff and the water is able to get through the the grains of sand and so a sand filter is a way of physically separating the the harder, the solid objects in the water and allowing the water to go through. But just because the water has, you've taken the poop out of the water or the solid things, it doesn't mean that water is really clean. You probably wouldn't want to drink the water. Of course, you'd never want to drink it anyway because it's salt water and we don't drink it. Um, but we also want to chemically filter our food or our food, our water. So we can add chemicals to make sure that chemically everything is working the right way. Now, I'm not saying necessarily add chemicals, but we can use chemical properties to remove waste from the water. So an example of that would be um, like if you've ever used a carbon filter. Now you might think what's a carbon filter. If you've ever had like a water pitcher, a Brita, I think these are less popular now, um, but there are little tiny black specks of carbon inside. And as you run your water from the tap um, over these filters, there basically are these surfaces on that carbon that's pulling out um, chemicals in the water that shouldn't be there. They're being chemically attracted to the carbon filter, all these little tiny pieces. And so once the water runs over all those, it can pull out other stuff in your water that you don't want to be there. So that's a chemical filter. And so we can do that as well um, here at the aquarium. But then there's also a third type of filtration. We have biological filtration that happens. And biological filters, biological means living, like live things. And so we can take advantage of like bacteria that can be useful, helpful bacteria to break down the waste from the animals, like all the ammonia that comes from them going to the bathroom that you don't want to keep in the water. Well, these living biological filters um, will actually remove that and turn that into less, the ammonia from the waste into less harmful nitrites and nitrates in the water. So all of our water goes through three types of filtration. And you can see all these pipes kind of leaning to some of those filtrations um, or some of that filtration right here behind the scenes. Um, do we have any other behind the scenes pictures that maybe we could take a look at um, as, as we go on a search for that? We'll see if we can find some other ones in our, our program that show um, kind of the, the non-pretty part of the aquarium because we love looking at the, the pretty parts where all the fish are swimming, but then there's the other parts. Now this is actually really cool. This is the other side. What we were looking at before um, was actually over, oops, right here. Am I, actually, now I'm getting turned around as I'm looking at this. <laughs> I got to make sure I know what I'm looking at. Oh, no, we were looking more at this spot, kind of right behind where they are, um, of where we were growing that coral. But from this view, we can see what it looks like behind the scenes at the top of our tropical reef habitat. So what do you notice in this picture? Obviously, we still have a a lot of water and there's railings around to make sure that you know no one's falling in. These are actually removable railings to give our staff easier access to the exhibit so that they when they're feeding the animals they can get really close um, 
In fact, right here, there's a stand right there. This is where we can feed our sharks or even our sea turtles if we need to. We can remove this railing here. Our staff step right down into there. And then we have little, um, like a target is what we call it, something we can put into the water that the different animals will recognize as their own special target so that they know this is where I need to go to eat and then I'll get my food right there. So if it's a shark, we might put in um, a lid. It's a white lid on the end of a stick so that the bonnethead sharks, which are a type of hammerhead, um, will swim on over to that area and will put their food on a pole. And as our staff are standing right there, those sharks will swim right on by here and grab their food off the pole. Now, if it's a turtle, we would use a different target. They have this little red target um, that they swim up to and then we can feed our turtles. They would get a totally different type of food than our sharks. Uh, they would get things like a, what we call a gel diet, a certain type of gel. It's not quite like Jell-O. It's got a few extra nutrients in it than Jell-O does. Uh, and also things like lettuce, romaine lettuce, um, because they're going to be more the herbivores and not have to eat. We're not going to feed them the clam and the fish uh, that the sharks might get. But these are all different areas. So here's another area where we can do a feeding right here. Um, we can also feed our animals from the surface from up here. So if these people had some food, they can throw out algae or nori. Maybe you've ever had it, like dried out seaweed. Um, that's some of the food that we feed our animals, and we can just throw that out from the surface, and it's kind of a first come, first serve. So there's different ways that we feed the animals, but this is what it looks like behind the scenes. Now, did you happen to notice how many lights we have around here? There are a lot of lights, even right up here. And we need to make sure that we keep these animals on the same time at the same time type of light and dark I'm having a hard time talking light and dark cycle that they would normally get out in their natural habitat. So in tropical areas there's a lot of sunlight and so we want to make sure that we're providing a lot of that sunlight for them um, to grow so it's more like their natural habitat. But then that also means that at night we don't keep this exhibit all lit up. If you were to visit the aquarium at nighttime it's going to look kind of dark in there. Um, after a certain time, we want to make sure that even though we won't be able to see very well, that our animals get a chance to rest too. But we also have boot moonlight. So we have sunlights. If it would be in a time of year that they would need to have moonlight, uh, we provide special lights that would be a filter creating moonlight for them. So that's kind of neat that we have that all behind the scenes. Uh, are there any other things you're wondering about? Did you notice this yellow? There's like an extra platform right here. Well, this is another space that allows us to kind of get over the top of the water uh, because below here, there's still places for the animals to swim. But we can get closer to the water and feed our zebra sharks. We can feed our rays um, right in this space here. And also this yellow thing right here is a crane. And it's one of the ways that we can help move our animals. So if we have a large stingray shark that's in this exhibit, to move it out or we want to weigh it. Maybe we want to know how big does that shark or how much does it weigh? We can weigh our animals here much like you would weigh your produce at a grocery store. Um, if you ever seen those hanging scales and you put your food inside of it and you, you know, it weighs it down and you look on the scale to see how much it is. Well, that's what we do with some of our animals, like our sharks. We can have them, we, what we call stretcher train them, which means the sharks will swim into a stretcher. Then we can pull up the sides and we can attach the sides of that stretcher onto the scale that hangs down from the top of this crane. And we're able to weigh a shark, much like you would weigh apples at the store, how much they weigh. Then we can put the shark right back into the water again. But this will assist us anytime we have to move a shark or a fish or a ray from one exhibit to another because we have other types of exhibits at the aquarium that maybe aren't quite as large as this one. Uh, or if we needed to take them to our Molina Animal Care Center, we would utilize this crane here and this space where we go out there on all sides of the animal to help around. So even around the outside edges, did you see that there are, it looks like there's some lights over here that are hanging down and then these are also tanks. So these are places where we can put new animals that we get at the aquarium when they're in their period of quarantine. Quarantine is a time that the animals, you know, we want to make sure that they don't have any diseases or sicknesses, so we keep them all by themselves. So quarantining an animal means, hey, these new fish that we got, we're going to keep you all by yourselves until we make sure that you don't have any parasites or sicknesses or diseases that you could spread to our healthy animals. 
And so we'll take care of them in their special little quarantine area until we know that they're safe and healthy enough to go into the exhibits with our other animals. So all of our animals, whether we get them from ourselves or, I mean, whether we um, get them from another zoo or aquarium or whether um, if we collect them ourselves, they will all go through a period of quarantine. Do we have another question? Okay, so great question from Ella. Um, how do we know, how do we get the animals trained to responding to their targets? How do they know which target is theirs? Well, it requires training and some patience, and it's actually something that we can do in quarantine. So when we get a new animal, one of the most important things we want to be able to do is how that animal get fed the food that they need. And how are we going to do that unless we have them trained to make sure that they get their food? So our food for like our sharks, our otters, our seals and sea lions get, gets measured every day for the particular animals that we are looking at. And we want to make sure that the bigger sea lion is going to get more food than the smaller seal. So they all have their own little separate pails and their food gets weighed every day. That bigger one is going to eat more food than the smaller one. And so we keep track of how much food that animal has eaten. So we need to make sure that animal knows where to go to get their food. And by putting a target in the water, what we'll do with that new animal is we'll determine what their target is going to be, what their object is. And so we'll put, whether, whether it's a wiffle ball on the end of a stick, like we do for our bonnet head sharks, um, or actually, is that our bonnet head? I don't remember. But a wiffle ball on the end of a stick, or a white lid on the end of a stick, or uh, a, like a dog toy, Kong. Um, there can be different things. It could be purple triangles. Um, but we'll lower that into the water every time that animal eats so that they realize that, oh, wow, every time I'm getting fed, this item goes into the water. Well, eventually we can put that item into the water first and then the animal will come over and then we'll, they'll know that this is their place to get food. So they kind of get trained. That's how we condition the animal to get trained when we first have them arrive at the aquarium. And we can do that in their quarantine area so they're not having to compete with any other animals for their food. Then once they're used to that, we can move them into a larger exhibit so that we know that we have confidence. And when we put that into the water, that animal will come to that spot to get their food. If they're spending time over here, that animal's gonna learn, I'm not gonna get my food. So that's how we're able to train. And it can actually, some animals get that pretty quickly. Some animals might take a, a few more months. Uh, we did find one time with some of our sharks that we had one shark that was having a hard time kind of getting it. But then when we added a couple other sharks that knew how to uh, target train, then suddenly that shark caught on and was like, oh, okay, this is what I do. So sometimes the animals can help us train the other animals too. So good question, Ella. Thank you so much for asking that. I hope that that is um, an easier answer to your question. And we even kind of do this under the water too. So when we have a diving or when we have a feeding, we have to coordinate with lots of different people. We have aquarists that are up at the surface that are maybe feeding the rays up against the wall over here. We have some who are feeding sharks over here. We have some that are feeding a different type of ray over here. And then we have divers that are going to different stations in the water that are target feeding different types of fish. So our big Queensland grouper might get fed in one spot where our other um, stingrays might get fed by the diver over here while a different type of stingray is being fed up against the wall. And then our smaller fish, we might even let them eat inside their little um, hidden area of the coral reef. So we'll take little squirt bottles uh, that have little worms in them or whatever, fill them up with, with water and worms, and then we go down to those exhibits and our divers can squeeze those squeeze bottles into the coral reefs where those smaller fish can hang out in protection so they don't have to worry about bigger fish trying to get their food because they've got the smaller bodies that can fit in the smaller spaces. So there's a lot of coordination that goes on with feeding the animals. So we know we have to feed them. We know we have to keep their water clean by filtering it um, by three different ways, physical filters, biological filters, and mechanical filters, um, or I'm sorry, uh, biological chemical and uh, physical filters. And then we also need to make sure the water temperature is right for those animals in the exhibits. We also need to make sure that the animals get along. Um, and so if we see an animal that's not getting along well with others, it need, needs to maybe go in a timeout or needs to go to an area. Um, we need to separate animals in a way that everyone is going to get along and be at the most at home in their habitat. 
But I hope that helped answer some questions or gives you a little bit of an idea of what goes on behind the scenes um, at the aquarium to bring you some of the exhibits that you see now. And remember, you're welcome. Even if you've never visited the aquarium before or any other aquarium before, you can visit us virtually anytime by checking out our webcams on our website. And you can look at our tropical exhibit anytime you want um, um, or our blue cavern exhibit. You can look at our sea um, jellies that are floating around and um, a couple other ones you can check out. So I encourage you to do that if you need some time to relax and just want to enjoy some animals. But thank you again for joining us today. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and goodbye. Oh, also, if there are any teachers that are joining us, feel free to um, 